Hello and welcome to the Arcadis video series on economics. Today we will talk about so-called elasticities, so about how much demand and supply react to price changes. But before we do that, let's quickly recap what we've learned so far about the demand and supply curves. The demand curve shows the willingness to pay and it's downward sloping. This means that as the price falls, more people with lower willingness to pay enter the market, increasing overall demand. Conversely, if the price goes up, the people with that lower willingness to pay exit the market, resulting in lower overall demand. This reaction is very common and we can assume it for almost all goods. When the price falls, we demand more and when it rises, there will be lower demand. The opposite is true for supply. When prices increase, firms tend to supply more and when prices fall, firms with a break-even price above the current new price stop supplying their quantities. But here's the important part. While we can reasonably assume these principles in almost all markets, the size of these effects can vary greatly across different product categories. Let's explore this with two examples, soft drink like Coca-Cola and gasoline. Now we can assume the aforementioned relationship for demand in both cases. If the price falls, we'll demand more, more soft drinks and more gasoline. And if the price rises, we'll demand less. The size of the effect, especially when prices increase, will be substantially different. You'll probably notice a much stronger reduction in the quantity demanded when the price of a soft drink increases as opposed to rising gasoline prices. And the reason is obvious. There are far more substitutes for a soft drink than for gasoline. If the price of one brand of soft drink like Coca-Cola increases, consumers can easily switch to another brand like Pepsi. They could also switch to another type of soft drink like lemonade or even opt for water, tea or beer. But when it comes to gasoline, alternatives might not be as feasible. If you have to drive a long distance, options like biking or public transportation might not be practical, especially in rural areas. At least in the short run, a lot of consumers of gasoline have no other option than to pay the increased price, as they need a certain quantity of the product to fulfill their needs. This brings us to the concept of elasticity of demand. It's defined as the reaction of quantity demanded in percentage terms to a 1% change in price. So if demand elasticity is minus 2, it would mean a price increase of 1% reduces the quantity demanded by 2%. And the value of 0.5 would mean the same increase of 1% in price only reduces demand by 0.5%. We use this 1% definition to make products comparable because the price of a soft drink increasing by 1 euro, for example, will have a much stronger effect than a 1 euro increase in the price of a car, simply because the price of that car is much higher in the first place. Typically, economists say that demand is elastic when the absolute value of demand elasticity is above 1 and that it is inelastic when the absolute value is smaller than 1. Knowing this demand elasticity would be of course extremely valuable for any company that is acting on that market. However, it's very hard to get a real estimate of it since you would need broad-based price changes as an experiment just to measure the real-life reaction of demanders. This is of course not something companies are likely to do. Nonetheless, economists try to calculate different elasticities. For example, for gasoline in the US, several studies estimate demand elasticity to be around minus 0.35, while for soft drinks the estimates lie around minus 1.6. So you see already that our intuition was right. Soft drink demand is rather elastic, so demanders typically react strongly to price changes. Should soft drink prices increase by 10%, quantity demanded will fall by 16% according to that estimate. For gasoline, this is apparently different. Demand is rather inelastic. Should gasoline prices go up 10%, quantity demanded would only fall by 3.5%. We can also express elasticity using the slope of the demand. If the slope is steep and the curve is close to vertical, it means demand is rather inelastic, like in the case of gasoline. On the other hand, a flatter curve signifies higher elasticity as shown here for soft drinks. Just compare the same price change for gasoline and soft drink demand and you'll clearly see how much stronger the reaction is for soft drink. All of this 
boils down to the ability to escape the market, which ultimately determines how elastic or inelastic the demand for a given product is. So let's delve deeper into the factors that determine this ability to escape the market and ultimately influence the elasticity of demand. These factors help us understand why the size of the effect varies across different products. The first factor is of course the number of substitutes available for a particular product. As established, the more substitutes there are, the easier it is for consumers to switch to alternatives when prices change. The second factor is the time frame. Elasticity can vary depending on the length of time customers have to adjust their behavior. In the short run, consumers may not have immediate alternatives, making demand more inelastic. However, in the long run, gasoline consumers, for example, can make changes such as switching to more fuel efficient vehicles or finding alternatives like electric vehicles. Another factor to consider is the category of the product itself you are analyzing. Is it a specific brand or is it an entire category? A specific brand typically has more substitutes. You can replace Coca-Cola with Pepsi, Fritz Cola or Sinalco. But if you use a broader definition, soft drinks as a whole, for example, it will be much harder to find appropriate substitutes. You may, for example, drink water or tea instead of soft drinks, but those will not be perfect substitutes. The next factor is whether the product is considered a necessity or a luxury good. Necessities such as basic food items or essential medications often have inelastic demand because consumers need them regardless of price changes. On the other hand, luxury items like high-end fashion or expensive vacations tend to have more elastic demand as consumers can easily cut back or choose alternatives when prices rise. Lastly, the size of the budget also plays a role in determining elasticity. When a product represents a large portion of a consumer's budget, small price changes can have a significant impact on demand. Right now, as students, for example, food will probably make up a larger part of your budget. Hence, your demand will be more price sensitive. Then, hopefully in a few years, when you surely have a much higher income and therefore devote a smaller share of your budget to food. So that's the elasticity of demand and we can do the same analysis for the supply side. Just like with demand, the slope of the supply curve can tell us a lot about supply elasticity. Take a look at the graph. When we have a steep supply curve, a small price increase will only result in a slight increase in quantity supplied. However, with a flatter curve, a similar price increase will trigger a much larger quantity reaction. So on the supply side, a flatter curve indicates higher elasticity as well. The values and the interpretation work in a similar manner. When the absolute value of supply elasticity is greater than one, it signifies an overproportional reaction to a 1% price increase, indicating elastic supply. Examples of elastic supply include easily producible items such as toothpicks or software. And on the other hand, a value below one again indicates inelastic supply. This means that quantity supplied increases by less than 1% if the price goes up by 1%. Goods that are harder to produce, such as houses in certain areas, fall into this category. And for extreme examples of very inelastic supply, think about pieces of art or collectibles. For instance, there might be only one pair of Air Jordans that Michael Jordan wore in his first match. Even if people are willing to pay millions for those shoes, it's impossible to produce more of them. The supply curve is vertical, indicating perfectly inelastic supply. Now let's discuss why supply elasticities differ. Take the example of vaccination rates during the corona pandemic in Germany. In the first half of the year, the number of administered doses increased only slowly. You might remember those days when it was very challenging to get a vaccine upon. The reason was simple. Manufacturers couldn't produce all the vaccine doses people demanded. So despite high demand for vaccination, suppliers couldn't keep up and the quantity didn't increase as much as we would have liked. But in December 2021, we can see in the data that things have changed. Due to a new variant of the virus, getting a third vaccine, the so-called booster shot, was recommended. And notice how much stronger the reaction was this time. This is because of higher supply elasticity. Demand for vaccination increased and suppliers now responded by significantly increasing the quantity supplied. So as you can see, the time frame plays a major role in determining elasticity of supply as well. In general, short run supply will be much less elastic than long run supply, as our vaccine example illustrates. 
It simply takes time to set up production facilities. In general, if it is difficult to increase production at constant unit costs, supply will be less elastic. For example, if you produce your raw materials such as oil or gold, or if you grow crops, the more you want to produce, the deeper you have to dig or the more land you have to use. Hence, it gets more expensive per unit to produce higher quantities. Supply will be inelastic, signified by a steeper supply. So there you have it, supply and demand elasticity. Understanding what these concepts tell us and the factors that influence them is crucial for market analysis. With this knowledge, we can analyze and predict how consumers and suppliers will respond to price changes. And we can incorporate the results of that into our market mechanism model.